Candy Valentino's upstairs talking to mom, getting ready to come down to the basement. She has some raw life lessons that'll help anybody recession proof themselves with some no BS truths. Learn from the trenches. She built her first multi million dollar business before she turned 21. Of course, she's been named a top business leaders 40 under 40, top 50 women in business, 10 people making a difference. She, along with Tony Robbins and Brene Brown, were also called by Success Magazine leaders who get results. She shares her gritty real world business and investing strategies strategies with an audience of millions through her founders organization. But you know what? She's sharing it here today on the Stacky Benjamin show. And here she is having a seat at the card table. Candy Valentino's here. How are you? Hey, Joe, I'm great. How are you? Good. You know, I was, I was wondering, you've been an entrepreneur forever and you know, here we are early in the new year. Do you set New Year's resolutions? I don't. <laughs> I don't set New Year's resolutions, um, but I obviously set yearly, quarterly, monthly, and even decade-long goals. So call them what you want, um, but I believe the resolution game is a little overused. Um, there's actually a thing that we're approaching really soon. It's called Quitter's Day, where everyone quits their resolutions because what it is is it's something, it's a moment in time that they try to have their hat on to do, but they don't change or develop the habits in order to actually get there. So now 25 years in business, building wealth, I just have the habits. So I just set new goals of what I want to do next. Yeah. How often do you look at those? Is it a weekly thing, a monthly thing? So it depends on which one we're talking about. Like I typically have either decade, three year, five year goals, somewhere visually just for me to kind of see like big picture. And those can change from time to time. Um, and then my monthly goals, I'm really addressing them, at least peeking at them daily. So it's just kind of, if it's a money goal, if it's a certain number of doors for real estate investing, if depending on what it is, health goal, and then I'm measuring what matters in relation to that, at least on a weekly basis. So if it's, it's, if it's in my business, I'm monitoring, say, sales and revenues or certain KPIs. If it's health goals, I'm finding out what I put in my body and I'm making sure that I review it and see, uh, should I have done that or not this? Did I get to the gym? Did I run? Did I do that? So I think that it has to be top of mind so that it becomes just part of our everyday. Like we don't have to think about brushing our teeth. We don't have yeah. to think about driving to our favorite coffee shop. Like we just automatically do it. And I believe that when you want to truly create a successful, a rich, a wealthy life, you have to have that automated too. I love this idea though, of visual. It's funny. I know uh, Tony Robbins is a mentor of yours and he talks about the power of visual. And I don't know the number of successful people that talk about, they keep that in front of them visually. There's something yeah. there. There's definitely a truth there, Candy, I believe that we all need to know. It's a science. I mean, oftentimes people think we hear manifestation and believe me, social media has certainly made it so fluffy. Like we just sit on the couch and decide we want something, but there's no action behind it to get there and it comes to you. Now that doesn't work. <laughs> but what I can tell you visually, it's just the way that our brains are wired. The reticulating activating system in our brain is a real thing. So when we have something visual that we're constantly seeing, constantly looking at, then it just helps us kind of pick that up in our environment. It helps us develop relationships that help us get there. I mean, I always say my journey of starting when I was 19 with no college degree, no corporate background, like no rich parents, no educated parents, like a lot of that was just visualizing what I wanted, reverse engineering that outcome, and then being courageous enough to just figure it out as I went along. I'm glad you brought up starting at 19, because that's really where I wanted to start. How did you do it? I mean, starting a business at 19 years old, what made, what made Candy Valentino go, you know what? I think I'm going to start this business. Yeah, well, you know, interestingly enough, like I said, neither my, my dad was uh, 19, my mom was 16 when they found out they were going to have me. I grew up on government assistance in a trailer in a really small rural town. And But what, one thing I did do that was very unique was I got dropped off at my dad's small business. He had an auto mechanic shop. He was self-employed my whole life. And so by the time I was five eight, 11 years old, I was running the office. I was answering phones. I was working with customers. So rather than learning dance or a sport, I kind of learned that whole business environment. And so for me, when I wanted to go to college, cause I thought oh, I'll be the first one to go to college. This will be so cool. And I was in my first business class and I was listening to this business professor 
And after the class, I said, oh, you know what, what business did you have? I was so excited to hear like what his revenue was and, and what he oh, started no. and his founder, oh, no. what he founded. Right. And he goes, oh, I, I don't, I don't have a business. I teach here. And I went, oh, well, did you have a business before? He goes, no, no, I went to school for business and I teach here. And something about my 18 year old brain could not reconcile the fact that you're teaching me about business, but you yourself have never built one, even though I just spent the last 13 years of my life inside of one. So something about my, switch. something about my 54 year old brain still doesn't get that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that was the switch for me. I was like, okay, forget it. Like, I'm just going to go do this on my own. I'm just going to figure it out. And so I just took the steps. Like, what do you need to do? I get an SBA loan. You know, I don't have any money. So get an SBA loan. I had a six week run rate, 45 days. I had seven employees when I started and I just tried to find a business model that didn't need, I didn't need a college degree for, I didn't need to have like a big fancy education or a lot of connections, something that was recession proof that had stood the test of time. But then I, I spun it with a little bit of innovation because I had heard a quote that said, you either innovate or you market better than the innovator. And so I was like, well, I can't innovate much, but I know that I can market something better. And that, that was the path that I chose. So I started wellness spas before they were kind of a thing on the East Coast. That's wild. And how, how quickly did you go from one spa to two spas to moving oh on? Oh my gosh. So, so there is a big, long journey through that. Instead sure. of just doing the locations, which I was focused on and really doing franchising, I also realized that there was, you know, a brand within a business that I could build. So I started developing my own products rather than buying products from someone and selling them with only a 50% margin. I was like, how can I buy these, make them myself and make 400%? Because what I learned early on was in that industry, our profit margin on, on average was only 9%. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do so much revenue in order to make any money. So I need to get smart about business and numbers. And so it was really between there till I was about 23 was when I started really understanding it, really growing, hit all of my revenue goals that I was after. And then realize that you've got to always be stretching because otherwise you're the, you're the lid, right? Like you have to be growing. You have to be having conversations, listening to podcasts like this, reading books, really self-educating so that you can expand your reality of the world in order to really grow and develop beyond what your current circumstance or your environment is. But even if you, even if you work for the man, I think there's the quote, the man, there's, there's so much uh, that you said that I think we need to pay attention to, like knowing the key statistics to get where you want to go feels like another truth here, right? Knowing which things matter, which things don't a 9%, 9% uh, uh, profit margin matters. Having yeah. 16 stores that are all not profitable doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, and it's that kind of stuff that people want to get, you know, they focus so much on all of these different tactics and business, but really business and, and, and personal finance at its core is so simple. We either increase revenue or we decrease expenses. Like it's either, it's not always what you make, it's what you keep, you know? And so if someone's working for someone else or in another job, like it's not even about the paycheck that you make. It's what you do with your paycheck that matters. How many assets you're, you're, you're creating, you know, what your cash flow is off of those assets, not just spending to look rich, but actually investing to be wealthy. And so those are some of the core things I learned really early just by reading books. And, you know, we didn't have podcasts and social media in the late nineties. Right. So it was books. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> Infomercials, maybe. <laughs> I want to go, I want to go back to you at five, seven, nine, eleven. You write in the book, Candy, that people said they felt sorry for you, right? Yeah. But you wrote that you didn't feel sorry for yourself. You had a blast with your, what, strawberry shortcake uh, yeah. bike with the banana seat and watching a little bit of TV and maybe going over and refilling the pop machine. Like this sitting on the sideline of an entrepreneurism to you was really, it sounds like fun, but, but in truth, your dad, your dad lost his job. He was down to how much money is last 200 bucks. Do I have that right? Yeah, you have that right. Last 200 bucks, hands it to this woman who wants $400 for one month's rent and says, can I work it off? Like, it feels like you learned hustle from an early age. Yeah, I definitely did. And I still bring that into everything that I do. And unfortunately, society has made hustle a bad word. Um, I totally disagree. I think hard work 
ethic, work ethic, hustle is what everyone needs unless you come from some epicuric childhood that you understand all these things and, you know, can come out of college with an amazing job and career or company. But um, for me, hustle was something I could control. My effort was something that I could control. And I think that that's something everyone can control. It's like we, we can't control the environment we were raised in. We can't control the circumstances or the decisions that got us to this point, but we get to decide what's next and what our next action is. And that's where true, true empowerment comes from. And so for me growing up, you know, I learned how to drive a car when I was seven so that I could back <laughs> up the cars in my dad's garage, like be able to move vehicles around for them. And, um, there was a, a, a car, we had a beat up ball bearing, which makes a loud tapping, like ta 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 when you yeah. drive. <laughs> yeah. And I had this little Mazda with a bad ball bearing and I would drive it all around. And I thought I was the coolest thing, but you know, people, would often say to your point, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you come here every day, but it was all I knew. And so to me, still to this day, like work is fun. Now, not all the crap that we have to deal with being a founder or an entrepreneur is always fun. Um, I think that's a bunch of BS that we're going to love what we do every day. But if you love the game, if you love business, if you love, you know, the data of business and really get involved in numbers and remove your emotion from it, that's what I see people do wrong is they, they attach themselves, their worth, their ego ego to money. And really money is just a result of effort. It's not a result of you. It doesn't define who you are. It just shows you whether you're on the right path or you need to switch your strategy or you need to implement and execute a little bit harder. You know, so I, I love how that just operates as a game and that's truly what it is to me. And so it's always been, it's always been a blast and something that I enjoy. You know, it's the, the piece of, of hustle culture that I don't like is is the idea of just creating wealth and it's funny because as i flip through your book and as i'm diving into the chapters of your book i realize that you're not truly your book's called wealth habits candy but you're not even after wealth like wealth is not what you're after you write that wealth is just a precursor to what you're truly after. And I, you know, the name of our show is Stacking Benjamins and I always get frustrated with people go, well, how don't you, why don't you tell me how to just get rich quicker? But it's not really, it's, it's not really about that. Like, tell me, tell me really for you what the end game is around your hustle. Yeah. So what I, how I always delineate it is it's not about making money. People try to accumulate money because they're trying to fill something within themselves. They're trying to feel significant. They're trying to have certainty. They're trying to control. They're, it's that ego at play. Maybe they felt, not, they felt at one point not worthy. To me, it's not making a bunch of money. To me, creating wealth is really freedom. It's creating a rich life. It's being able to gift what you want, donate what you want, contribute what you want. Because we all know the stories of the people that were rich as far as a balance sheet or rich in their net worth, but they had a bankrupt life. They had a bankrupt relationship. They weren't happy. And they're the ones that we hear about that, that kill themselves or, you know, do horrific things because money will never be enough if that's all you're after. But creating a rich life is, is truly what I realized when I was 23 and I had had all the goals, right? All the things that I set out to do. I wrote my first set of goals after I listened to a Tony Robbins infomercial when I was 15. It was like the first time I had heard about like goal setting and all this stuff. And so I sat in my high school cafeteria like a nerd and wrote these goals out and started the company at 19 and then had them all by the time I was 23. And when I had bought, I was buying commercial real estate. And when I bought this one building, and I know I've told people have probably heard this story over and over, but I saw this one building and was like, what am I going to do with it? And it was like the realization in that moment at 25 years old that I had accomplished everything I sought out to do, that I was making more money than anyone I knew at that time, that I had had all the things but I still felt like something was missing. Oh yeah. And I think oftentimes people don't feel that at 25, they feel it at 45 or 55 or 65. And they forget that like that one thing that you think you're after, it isn't money. It's creating the rich life that I think we all crave where we're fulfilled. And, and not only just my life, but in all the research for the book, the only way that you can do that is to contribute to something beyond you. If you're always looking at what you can get out of life, 
and you're not looking at what you can bring to life, you will eventually at some point get to the end of yours and look back and see, what did I miss? Why do I feel like this? I just feel so great, grateful that I felt that at a young age because it totally put me on a different trajectory of giving. And that's why the last habit in the book talks all about giving. That is, and, and I want to talk about that too, because I was so happy to see that. That, that giving is such a big part and having the service mentality has become such a big part of my life. But to your point, I had to learn that when I was much older, well, like to get to truly to get that message at 23, 24, like, is this it? Is this, is this, you know, I think about that old movie, Wall Street and Charlie Sheen saying to, it's saying to, uh, uh, Michael Douglas, like how many yachts can you water ski behind? Like that is truly, is this what it's about? Uh, some mm-hmm. people don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> like, maybe that reference is too old. But I want to I want to get back to you and 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 learning from an early age about entrepreneurship. And I'm going to quote you from the book. You write even more important than some of the business specifics I learned, such as customer service and office management. And by the way, how great candy to learn those at a young age because I feel like these quote soft skills that you learn about dealing with people and dealing with customers are some of the most important skills any business owner or or frankly anybody working in any job should have. Yes. <laughs> what was the psychology I learned? I saw how my father managed the ups and downs of the business. I saw he had to swallow his fears. And sometimes, by the way, and I'm going to add this in, his pride, it sounded like, and keep going. I learned about determination and persistence. I learned about the mindset of providing quality service to customers and taking care of people, even when it wasn't convenient for yourself. I thought that was, that was, that was pretty powerful. So you tie all of this in your second, your second habit is about learning your way to wealth. And I'm going to dive in a little bit to learning it because clearly you're learning at age five, you're learning at seven, you're learning at eight. Let's be clear. And I think we already made this clear when you talked about your business professor. You're not talking about a college education, are you? No. I have no college education. I think I lasted about 12 weeks in college before I had that conversation. Um, I don't even know if any of the credits qualified. Um, so no, no, no college education whatsoever. So I'm literally self-taught, which is why I feel it's important for people to understand that that's something you can do too. Like you can learn your way into an industry, learn your way into wealth, into having that fulfilled life, into not trading time for money, you know, and you had mentioned about, um, those soft skills in business, like no matter what industry you're in right now, whether you work for yourself or for someone else, like it doesn't matter the industry, what you're in is the people business. And I learned that really early. And that was something that I drove into all of my employees and all the companies I've created is it doesn't, we're not in the spa industry. We're not in the jewelry industry. We're not in the service industry. We're not in the product industry. We're in the people industry because we're touching real people and having impact in real lives. And even when I had my last exit in 2019 and I came into this space, it was like, how can I serve? Who can I show up for? And when you come from that place, that's when work, even when it's optional, becomes fun again because you're you're focusing on the person that you can help. In true transparency, I didn't even want to write a book. Like it was something that had toyed around in my mind for a long time, but it was one conversation that led to like one direct publisher pitching me. Like like so it wasn't even something that I had an agent and sought out to do because it's a very personal thing, like putting all of that in there. Like my my dad was a mechanic. My mom cleaned houses. Like I saw how people treated them sometimes, you know, being a a less than, and I'm using quotes if you're not visually seeing this type of profession, like I saw how people treated them and how my dad did have to swallow his pride and had to figure it out and still had to show up. And so it taught me so much about people and how to really appreciate when someone pays you for something, like they're taking their money that they just worked for, that they left their family to go do, to then give you for a product or service. And if you don't take that seriously, it's like disrespecting that person and what they do. And so I feel that every single business, every industry, every company that I'm in, and I really do my best to teach my teams that. And that's not something that comes from a college education. That's something that comes from life experience. You talk about though, creating your own education and you, you, you have four different areas, read, uh, reading quality books, uh, listening to Ted talks, audiobooks, lectures, podcasts, 
learn, build your skills by attending specific training programs, seminars, and courses. Model, find experts in the area where you're trying to become an expert. I want to ask you a little bit about modeling because you talk about how you're somebody who, so you're 19 years old, you don't have access, right? You don't have access to these people. Now we have things like masterclass now where you can go out and, and, yeah. and learn from some some of the greatest minds. But you are have gone from a person that didn't have access to now somebody that does, I'm assuming you had to create that access. How did you, what was the tactic you used to create access to some of these mentors that you now have in your life? Mm, so you're, you're not going to love, now I don't think I've ever been asked this question, by the way, but I don't think you're going to like the answer. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I see coming into this space, how people do that, right? They try to get in the room and they try to get around this person and they try to have the conversation. And to me, that feels very take, that feels very selfish. It feels all about the person and what they can get and how they can up level their life. And it's not an equal energy exchange. I have never come from that place. Number one, I built success first. I didn't try to get into the room to have success. So totally different energy. And then I had no problem paying for it because I valued their opinions. I valued their time. And so it came from a different place of like, I'm not going to try to ask you to come speak at my event. What's your speaking fee? And I will gladly pay it because you're worth it. And when you come from that energy and you come from that intention and then the person meets you and they're like, whoa, like this is the real deal. Like she's actually built stuff. She's actually done stuff. Then they welcome you with open arms into your world. And so it's a different energy exchange. It's what can I give? It's who can I connect with, but in a, in a very natural, organic way, not in a strategy or a tactic. I want to ask you one more question on, on learning that uh, surprised me, frankly. Um, you, you say that one of the mistakes you see people make is that they focus on education as a whole. What does that, what does that mean? What are, you, what are you talking about? We get too tactical with our education? So I see society talking about education. Go get an education. And really what they mean is go get a college degree. They're not actually meaning to specialize in one specific niche, industry, skill or trade that you're going to get a direct ROI on your time. So what happens is again, society, and this is nothing against anybody with college educations. I have tons of friends, more friends that are educated than not. Um, but you know, obviously this isn't a knock on them. It's just a different way of thinking. And it's just thinking that not everyone needs to be self-educated and not everybody needs to go to college. Although society tells us everybody should go get an education. So it's a little more of a holistic approach where instead of just saying, go get a degree, and how many people do you know that got a degree and they don't even use that degree in that industry for what they actually make money in? What if you took those four years and instead of getting $85,000 a year for a school loan, which is what the industry average was when I actually did the research for the book last year, what if you actually instead got $10,000 and started a business? Or what if you went and tried to learn a trade or a skill? You know, I know so many people that are in the HVAC and electrical space that make bank and they yeah. don't have a four year or six year degree. And yet there's people with a master's degree that take an entry level job because they can't find something in their field because they didn't do the research ahead of time to see if it was a viable skill in the current economy. So the way I view education is getting a direct ROI on the time and money that I invest in it. Like what can I learn that will produce a result that I can then either plug into my business or that I can develop service or a product from in order to deliver it. And that's how you make more earlier in your life so that you can invest sooner. And then compound interest will give you more millions when you come to retirement age. Man, and I love in your book that, that you know, don't just get tactical about what do I need and then I'm going to apply so I can use it and then I remember it. But then also, also think a little bit, I hate the term outside the box, but, 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 but think a little bit outside, like who can teach me this that's not the standard person? Like how can I expand upon this idea so that I can maybe bring something new to the thing that I'm thinking about. I thought that was, that was important. I only have 67 more questions left. Uh, but the one that's really important I want to ask before we go, I actually want to talk about the end of the book after this, but I want to talk about the saw tax because as people are working the way through your six habits, I think this is a really important concept to understand. Candy, what's the saw tax? Oh, it's such a good one. It is the tax that everyone pays 
when they either are successful, they're achieving, or they're wealthy. And this is the tax that it just happens because when you want to go out there and you want to go for success, even if you're not successful yet, or you want to start achieving, even if you haven't yet, or you want to start to create wealth, there are going to be people that tell you you can't, tell you you shouldn't, tell you why you don't want those things or why you shouldn't want those things. And it's going to come with criticism, judgment, and possibly even some hate. That is the tax you pay to go after your dreams. And I can tell you that if you value what you want out of life more than the criticism and the opinions of others, you will be able to create more than you can ever imagine. Starting out as a female founder at 19, like in the late 90s, guys, like this wasn't a thing. There was no <laughs> boss babe. There was no girl empowerment. Like, I mean, I remember. I was say, how easy then. was that, Candy? Tell us how easy oh, that was. Oh Just gosh. super easy. <laughs> Like, and then being 21, like trying to invest in real estate and people are like, oh, where's your husband? You know? And I'm like, I don't have one. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just like the craziest thing. And, and it, we've come a long way in 20 years, 25 years. Um, but we also need a little ways to go. I mean, it wasn't that long ago I was in a dealership and they literally were talking to my boyfriend the entire time and not You're kidding me. And I was like, Hi, like I'm going to be writing a check for the car. You might want to talk to me about the, what it does. So that still happens nowhere near as much. But I think it's just important to remember that if you decide, like you listen to this podcast, you hear Joe talk all the time, like you want to go create this life for yourself. It's, it's not so much anybody's fault. Like the people around us want sameness. They like you or they're getting something from you or you feel a need in their life in some way. So they want you to stay the same, even if they, it's not intentionally malicious. So oftentimes when you go to evolve and you go to change, people see that difference in you and you could just very well be triggering lack in them because it's a heck of a lot easier for them to talk about you or judge you than it is for them to go change their own life, which it's available for them too. So I think if we understand the psychology of pe why people do it, then we don't get emotionally hurt or attached to their feelings. And then we understand that the saw tax is just something there that has to be paid just like to the IRS. It's almost, you just, you got to roll your eyes and go with it. Just, yep, this is, this is a, this is a direct result. Actually, after reading your book, I think people should kind of feel good that you're getting the hate. You're like, okay, this means That's I'm right. actually making a mark. This means, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, when did the giving button, you know, your last wealth habit is about giving your way to wealth. When did, when did you get the giving aha? As I mentioned earlier, Candy, it took me a while. And when I did, I'm like, why the hell didn't I realize this earlier? Like the more I give, the more, the wealthier I am by far. Like it's not about me giving to other people. It's about, I have this huge wealth because of the giving thing. Like when did you get that aha? So I remember probably being six, seven years old and going to Hills department stores, which were out on the East coast. And I remember there was these Christmas trees with these little handwritten ornaments on them that you could take off. And on the back would be a child's name, age, and gender. And you could get a toy for the kid. And I remember wanting to get a toy. Didn't know who these kids were, but I knew what it was like to not have. And so I thought if I could take one of my Christmas gifts and give one of these kids one of my Christmas gifts, that that maybe that would make their Christmas a little brighter too. At six. So, at six. Yeah, six or seven. So it became a yearly tradition then. And as my dad started to be more successful and have a little more money, then each of us took, there was the, you know, I'm an only child. So each of us took a, a kid. And I remember getting the photos. Every once in a while, you would get a Polaroid, like literally a Polaroid of the kid holding the toy and just their faces and how happy they were. And I remember that feeling of how happy that made me. And so fast forward a little bit older when I had my first like business and I was working with my dad and I was reselling golf balls to, for a whole other podcast, but I was cleaning up <laughs> golf balls and reselling them back to the golfers where our trailer was parked on this golf course, like near it. And, um, so I, you know, had some money and I was starting to get these things in the mail from like different charities. And so I would send $5 in this envelope and $5 in that envelope. And I remember my dad seeing me do it and he said, you're going to give all your money away if you keep doing that. And I didn't listen. I kept doing it. And then it was, you know, interesting at 25 when I had had all of those goals and I had that empty building sitting there and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. 
I remember thinking like, what am I going to do with that building? And it was like that instinct happens that I think we all get. Like, I don't think we get it later. I think it happens earlier, but I think we ignore it because we're so focused mentally or logically on what we want that we kind of don't hear those little nudges or hear that little guiding voice. And I think because of being a child from an abusive situation as a, you know, I've always kind of had to listen to that voice because that was my guiding light. That was what told me what to do. And so I, it was, you know, clear as day, 25 basically told me to donate that building to charity and start a nonprofit. And lot, I mean, I wasn't a multi, multi million, you know, I didn't have like, it wasn't like that. Like I wasn't like Elon at a young age. Like I was just doing well, like better than I thought, you know, I would be doing from my, my beginnings. And I was just like, okay, yeah. Like, yes, yes. Like it was just like unequivocally. Yes. And rather than questioning it, cause this is what I think happens with people. I think we get the instinct, we get the nudge, we hear that we're supposed to do something. And then within one half of one second, our brain kicks in and starts to talk about all the reasons why we shouldn't, why we can't, why that doesn't make sense rather than just doing our brain says what your dad said to you, you're going to give away all your money. Meanwhile, no one ever goes broke by giving money away. They go broke by spending it. They go broke by investing in some get rich quick scheme. Nobody goes broke by giving it away. And so when I heard that, I just was like, yes, I'm going to start a nonprofit. So at 26, I founded a nonprofit. Um, I actually had four additional locations at that time. I was working with a, a franchising attorney and I knew I can either do this or I could do this nonprofit. And it was one of the hardest decisions. And probably from a business standpoint, people would looking back, that probably cost me about a 10X multiple on one of my exits, but it was the best decision I ever made because it didn't just help the community. It didn't just give back. It actually healed me, which is why the name is Heal Animal Rescue. It actually healed me in such a big way. And it taught me a lot about life. And I think that we're all giving those opportunities, but we just rationalize our way out of them. We think our way out of them. So I just always encourage people that when you get that gut instinct, when you get pulled to something, when something breaks your heart, like don't shy away from it, walk towards it. Cause there may be truly something more purposeful for you in it or some healing for you in it or life lessons that you need to learn. You dedicate your book to rescue dogs. And I think we've seen your buddy in the background a couple of minutes, yes. a couple of times here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hanging out with yeah. us. The book is called Wealth Habits, Six Ordinary Steps to Achieve Extraordinary Financial Freedom, as you can already tell from talking to Candy. It's incredibly extraordinary. I don't think there's anything ordinary about this. There's a lot of aha uh -huh in, a, in, a, in a short period of time in this book. And it's available everywhere and coming out on audiobook. You told me before we hit record. Yes. Yes. And all proceeds go to charity. So I'm not making a dime from it. We're donating all the proceeds again, just as our way to give back. And so you can get it anywhere. Audiobook will be out on Audible, Audible I think the end of January. So depending on when you're listening, um, you can grab that too. Thanks for hanging out with us and helping stackers everywhere become wealthier and meaning that in a getting more freedom kind of way. Thanks so much, Candy. Yes. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.